Hey, everybody. I think we're on now, right? I, I think we're live. I think we're live. Oh, wow. Amazing. I'm um, sorry about my uh, hairdo. I had to wear this um, cap because, you know, if I take this out, my hair is not the best. I worked all day and so here I am. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for joining live on your busy, busy after work day um, to come and celebrate with us our 20 years Vice Institute anniversary. It means a lot to me. Um, you know, like I talked about in the last episode, you know, time just went by so fast. Um, you know, I graduated in 1997, and in 2003, uh, we started our institute, and the original name was Bite Seminar. Uh, me and Dr. Ron Elloway, and we started this uh, little uh, study club, right? And it was funny. How we started was, I was taking a mission institute. Um, this was weekend program. And one of the doctor that was sitting beside me, and his name was Dr. Ron Alloway, much older surgeon, uh, who happened to be in come from Vancouver as well. And as we were coming, flying back to Vancouver, you know, I asked them, why do we have to travel so far just to learn something about implant dentistry? Why can't we start something ourselves? And that was the start of starting a local study club and then of course over time uh, we got to meet other doctors who became our faculty and here we are uh, who knew who knew uh, tonight i know why you guys are tuning in it's not about me uh, we're here to start an episode two and we have a very special guest and we're going to keep uh, this uh, intro session very casual uh, nothing formal, um, so no further ado. I want to log in. Is Dr. Jeff Lee here? Yeah. There you hey. go. Hi, everybody. This is not fair. Look at you. You look like you took shower. You dyed your hair. You know, look so good. <laughs> <laughs> I have three more hours ahead of you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Three more ahead of you. Well, I just finished my work, so here we are. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Not only Thank you have you. So uh, a good, great presentation um, ahead of us, but you know we wanted to have uh, this a little chat because I know a lot of the doctors who know Spice Institute who have learned from you, okay, and you've been with mm -hmm. us for you know quite a few number of years, right? But yeah. you know, to always it's a nice to have you um, face to face right and introduce yourself mm -hmm. as well so uh, tell us a little bit about you your background you know not just a dr jeff lee the great periodontist from toronto but you know who are you you know your beginning and your process yeah. of you know your childhood where you went to school and what you like to do give us a little bit of that yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's such an honor to be part of Bites and be part of this 20-year uh, celebration. You know, I congratulate you, Dr. Kwan, for keeping this up. What started as a really small little thing has now become a worldwide phenomenon, really. So I think it's uh, really something to applaud. Um, you know, for me, I, I was born in China, and uh, I'm an only child. Uh, my parents actually... Um, this I kind of think helped shape who I am today, but uh, when I was two, my dad went to Sweden to start a, his studies. Um, so I didn't really grow up knowing him that much. Um, and then when I was five, my mom also flew there to join him to start her studies. Um, so I stayed in China for another half year with my grandparents. And then at the age of five and a half, most people don't know this, but I actually flew with a stewardess, but I flew by myself from China to Sweden at five oh and a half, goodness. which is, if you think about that nowadays, it's unimaginable. Um, it's and a long even flight. Just starting from that age, I would walk to and from school by myself, you know, and be home by myself just because, you know, my parents had to work and I had to just be independent. And I think I learned a lot of that independence through, through that young age. Um, we moved to Toronto here. My mom's has a younger sister that, you know, moved here before us. 
So Toronto became a destination for us so that they could reunite and we could have a bit of family. And uh, so we've been here since I was nine. So that was uh, back in 93. And, um, you know, we've been here ever since. I grew up with uh, my cousin, Kim, who is a year younger than me, but really just like a sister to me more than a cousin. Um, and now the family and, you know, other cousins have joined us. The family's really grown here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to high school here. I uh, loved playing basketball from an early age. So I've still been a big basketball fan, a big Raptors fan, despite their not so great season this year. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I've um, went to school at Western for, you know, my undergrad studies before I did my dental training in the States. Oh, yeah. tell me a little bit of uh, your undergrad. What did you study in undergrad? So at Western, I studied medical science. Uh, so the four year program were uh, pretty generic, I would say, kind of the pre-med, pre-dental program. And then you went to UPenn, right? Yes, I went to UPenn for dentistry. Uh, and then straight out of dental school, I went to the University of Michigan for my periodontal training. Yeah. That's where the Dr. Homelay, Homelay Wang. Yes. Yes, he's still there. I just saw him recently at uh, the American Academy of Perio meeting. Wonderful. And then you, after you graduated Paris, why, why Michigan, though? I mean, I mean, it's, it's a great school, but so does UPenn. Yeah. UPenn and other, there's a lot of good parallel schools in states. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I interviewed at uh, six programs, um, and honestly, Michigan was probably last on my list when I, when I applied. <laughs> and that's just how life goes, I think, you know. So by the time I interviewed at Michigan, it was my last interview, I had already had acceptances from a few schools, um, mm. schools that I had ranked higher than Michigan. So I was actually looking to cancel my trip, cancel my flight, get a refund, but it was non-refundable, of course. And uh, I had a friend from high school who was at the University of Michigan. So I figured, you know, we've already planned the weekend to kind of hang out. Might as well just go and, and do that. So I came or I went to Michigan with like zero expectation. And I think within the first 45 minutes of listening to Hamlet talk about the program, talk about its legacy, I was sold, you know, and, and on that day of the interview, we found out who got in, and who didn't. And we had 48 hours to tell him if we were going to accept the position or not. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I remember uh, bumping into him many, many years ago. It was one of the conference, mm -hmm. and one thing I remember with him is his passion. Yeah. And when he speaks, there's a level of he's a very inspiring person, you know, and he he left a very uh, strong impression on me, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the same thing. What happened to you? It's hard he's to shake very him much off, like yourself. <laughs> so it's hard to shake him off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a few of those, like doc, Dr. Homelay Wang is one. Salama, mm -hmm. Maurice Salama, he's another one of those. Mish yeah. was one of those. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a, a power in their words. Yeah, but I, I think uh, um, it, was, it was a good choice. Yeah, it's more of a conservative uh, program, isn't it? Like, uh, you, know, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No nonsense. Very fundamental, I would say. Very fundamental. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. Oh, very good, very good. Um, t tell me, I always ask this to all my faculty. The same question goes, when you first met me, what did you think of me? <laughs> yeah, that's a, I honestly, it, it leads really well from talking about uh, homely because you gave me that same kind of uh, passion and fire you know it's it just kind of exudes from your body language your tone of voice you know the words you're actually saying and I think um, you know as we just recalled I was more quiet when we first met and you know you did most it of the talking Toronto. but I listened and uh, I felt like it was a connection a very strong connection right from the beginning and very grateful to have had that opportunity. And, you know, six years later, 
we've collaborated even from across the country on so many different yeah. projects and uh, I'm very grateful and you know very humbled as well so I, I, I do remember that moment very fondly at that uh, breakfast that we had it was breakfast yeah, I, I kind of remember uh, it was you introduced by Ray and we had a breakfast yeah. together and you didn't talk much um, but you know like for me like Jeff you are like an acquired taste um, okay. the more I get to know you I really get to know you, you know? Mm -hmm. and as much as uh, you speak highly of me. Uh, I learned a lot from you as well. And to be honest, like before you came on board, we didn't really have a specialist that was a part of our faculty. Um, right. And when you came on board, we were really able to uh, push the, the fundamental perio and that part of the curriculum that a lot of the doctors that we felt it was very very essential very very essential yeah for and sure. of, of course yeah and you have in the past six years i see you advance and grow uh, not only as a clinician but as an educator and uh you've mm -hmm. uh, uh represented by institute you know, very very well yeah i'm very proud of you absolutely Thank absolutely you. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, presentation that you have prepared for us. Okay. I mean, I've mm -hmm. listened to your presentation many, many times, but yeah. every time I listen, there's something more to it. Okay. Introduce to us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was tough. I mean, my presentation is on Socket Shield. I'm sure some of the viewers have seen my longer lectures on Socket Shield, but as you've always said, Dr. Kwan, it's very difficult to come up with a 15 minute presentation, harder <laughs> than a full day lecture, you know? So um, it's about getting every single word kind of to send the right message, to send, you know, the message that you want to convey. So my message for Socket Shield is that, you know, as a periodontist, I believe in preserving things, preserving the periodontium, preserving teeth, preserving gums. and. Um, only when we really have to do we do we rebuild things and regenerate things. But mm -hmm. uh, there's no real other kind of uh, procedure in implant dentistry as biologically, you know, preservative or driven as the socket shield concept. And I think that um, that's why I have such a passion for it. Not only do we get you know the aesthetic results, but I think it's mm -hmm. the reason that we get these aesthetic results that's what drives me. Right? It's the biology we're able to maintain um, to really make it look like nothing happened. I actually just did a case of it today and it was mm. extremely rewarding for me and for the patient and you know even my team now that they've kind of seen more and more of it have become mm -hmm. more excited about these types of cases. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah and over the past few years you really became the face of socket shield you know root membrane guy in this country so what I want to do is, no further ado, I want to welcome the audience who have joined us live. I think you're going to really, really enjoy this uh, short but impactful presentation. It's a guided socket shield therapy by Dr. Jeff Lee. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Lee and I'm a periodontist from Toronto, Canada. As a proud faculty member of Bites Institute, I am so honored and privileged to be a part of its 20-year celebration and to present a case on one of my favorite implant topics, the socket shield. Today I will be showing a guided socket shield case and why it should be the new gold standard for the aesthetic anterior implant. My implant journey began after finishing dental school at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. Then I went to the University of Michigan for my periodontal specialty training. And upon graduation, I worked at a periodontal clinic called Perico in Boston, Massachusetts, while also serving as a clinical faculty at Harvard Dental School. Six years ago, I moved back home to Toronto and currently work mainly at my clinic, Peterborough Periodontics. On the educational side, 
I am a faculty member at Bytes Institute and became a key opinion leader as a Megagen Minec Knight three years ago. Whenever an implant patient presents to us, we have so many things to document and consider before we can properly diagnose the concern and formulate a treatment plan. This risk assessment process is extensive with many factors to account for, such as history of the tooth, patient expectations, soft and hard tissue quality and quantity, and many more. This list I present here highlight many important aspects, but is definitely not exhaustive. From my perspective, when assessing a patient for an aesthetic implant, three phrases really sum things up. Bone sets the tone, tissue is the issue, and buccal plate sets the fate. Let's keep these three statements top of mind throughout the presentation. As with any clinical procedure we do in dentistry, understanding why and having a sound evidence-based approach is very important. It is well documented that we face challenges with bone volume after tooth loss in general, and especially pertaining to a maxillary anterior tooth. The original human study that assessed alveolar dimensional changes after tooth extraction was done by Schropp in 2003 and revealed 50% reduction in bone width in the first three months. A more recent systematic review by van der Weyden showed average bone loss of 3.87 millimeters in width and 1.67 millimeters in height. So right away, we know the level of challenge that we face. Next, we want to know if the aforementioned changes occur in all scenarios or only if the bone remaining is very thin. Boozer's group looked at how clinically relevant these changes were and contrasted the difference between sites with thin bone versus thick bone. He concluded that at eight weeks, there is a significant difference of over six millimeters of bone width loss if the buccal plate was less than one millimeter after extraction. To make Boozer's group's finding more relevant, this study by Lindy's group simply looks at the thickness of the buccal plate using CBCT measurements and concluded that in the anterior maxilla, 85% demonstrate a buccal plate thickness of less than one millimeter and 50% less than half a millimeter. Basically, that means 85% of maxillary anterior sites will lose an average of 7.5 millimeters of bone width following extraction, which is almost the whole tooth from the buccal to palatal direction. Now, we know how challenging this area of the mouth can be. Finally, another publication by Boozer's group provides a nice summary of treatment protocols and objectives for aesthetic implant sites. The primary objective is to achieve long-term aesthetic outcome with high predictability and low risk of complication for both hard and soft tissues. Secondary objectives include reduced number of surgical interventions, especially open flap procedures, least amount of pain and morbidity for the patient, and the shortest overall treatment and healing time that is also the most cost effective. Beyond the anatomical challenges, there are several other factors that we face when doing immediate implant therapy, especially in the aesthetic zone. Obviously, we want to minimize trauma during extraction, and there are many techniques to achieve this. Additionally, the implant size and its 3D position is very important for the amount of bone fill between the implant and the buccal plate. Over time, we have learned to position an implant of smaller diameter more towards the palate to maximize the size of this jump gap and to allow for more bone fill. However, is this all enough? For those that have done implants, especially anterior implants, we know that over time this bone will shrink. So is there another modality that can overcome or prevent this? It certainly is a tall order to achieve all of these goals, and that is where the socket shield technique comes in. The socket shield technique has many other names such as the root membrane technique and partial extraction therapy. It is based on the idea of root submergence, which has been around since the 1980s. Specifically, the socket shield concept was first introduced in 2010 by Drs. Herzler and Zerv from Germany, and the main idea is to keep a thin buccal portion of the tooth, which maintains the blood supply for both hard and soft tissues. In their proof of principle report, Drs. Herzler and Zur deliberately left a portion of the root during extraction and placed an implant near it. They concluded that this socket shield did not interfere with osteogreen integration of the implant 
and therefore may be beneficial in preserving the buccal bone plate. Another group spearheaded by Miltiades Mitsias and Constantinos Sirompras refers to this method as root membrane technique. And they have also published a lot of initial information and more recently, plenty of follow-up studies that support the long-term success of this technique. Another industry leader, Dr. Howard Gluckman from South Africa, uses the term partial extraction therapy and also has many publications showing promising results and also detailing the protocol. In this four-year follow-up study of 128 socket shield cases, he concluded that the technique performs competitively in terms of implant survival rates compared to both conventional immediate and delayed implant placement protocols. Howard Gluckman also has a two-part publication with lots of detail on the history, indications, contraindications, protocol, and management for partial extraction therapies. In the first part, he notes the different techniques and their indications, as well as some contraindications such as active periodontitis and mobility of the root fragment. A third relatively controversial contraindication is external resorption. In the second part of his publication, he highlights the procedure itself and possible complications. The most common complication is exposure of the shield, which can be either internal or external. Usually, this is resolved relatively easily. However, some severe complications may necessitate the removal of the shield or loss of implant, but these are very rare. I highly recommend you read these two articles from the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry to get a comprehensive understanding of partial extraction therapy. When it comes to executing the socket shield technique, there are several kits available, but I prefer the Partial Extraction Therapy Kit by Megagen, and this video will demonstrate its use. First, you want to measure the root length on the CBCT to determine where to place the stopper on the number one drill, and then use it to drill through the root canal space to the apex. Then, the number two drill is used to split the root, making sure that you extend the full length of the root going in a mesial distal direction. The palatal fragment is then carefully removed and the number three round burr are used to reduce the buccal shield to the desired thickness. Next, the number four burr is used to smooth the internal portion of the root all the way down to the apex as seen here. After that, the number three round burrs are used as well as the number 5 burr to reduce the crustal portion of the root down to the level of the bone. This is very important so that we are not leaving a piece of the root at the tissue level. Finally, the number 6 burr is used to make a chamfer margin allowing extra space for the restoration and the bone graft. Once a socket shield is prepared, regular implant drilling and placement is done, and bone graft can be placed along with a customized provisional. Now, let me introduce my patient, who is a 60-year-old male with a fractured 2-1. This patient has had this crown, which has an obvious color mismatch and a size discrepancy from the 1-1 for a long time. Perhaps his aesthetic demand isn't the highest, but he does have a high smile line, and therefore, this is still a challenging aesthetic case. The intraoral picture shows chronic marginal inflammation due to the multiple times that the crown has been re-cemented. There's also slight recession compared to the 1-1. The PA shows a root broken at the gum line and a short root canal treatment. The CBCT slices confirm the short root canal treatment and blunting of the root apex and there is a significant void between the crown post complex and the remaining root. This buccal plate has decent thickness, and there is plenty of apical bone into which we can anchor our immediate implant. This is a great case for a socket shield. The occlusal view shows some moderate crowding, especially with the 2-2, and some slight incisal wear as well. Note the buccal gingival contour preoperatively as well. So the first step of the socket shield is to remove the crown. 
In this case, it was already loose, so this removal was simple. In other situations, the crown can be sectioned from the root. Note here the irritated marginal tissue on the buckle and extending to the distal aspect. So after the crown is removed, the number one drill is used with its stopper to drill through the root apex to, of the root. The, this distance should be measured on the pre-op CBCT. The next step is to use the number two drill to split the root in a mesial distal direction. I try to do this in a semi-lunar shape to try to keep some interproximal root structure to help maintain the ever important interproximal bone. Once the two fragments are separated, a narrow proximator or elevator can be used to remove the palatal fragment carefully. This should be done without putting any pressure on the buccal fragment, and the instrument should never be placed in between the buccal and palatal pieces. After the palatal portion is removed, the buccal fragment should be checked for any mobility. If there is mobility, then unfortunately the shield has to be removed. So this is what the root looks like after the palatal fragment is removed. And now it is time to start shaping it into a proper socket shield. So here we use the number three round burrs to reduce the shield to the desired thickness throughout the whole length of the root. And then the number four drill is used to smooth the internal portion of the root. Finally, number five and six drills are used to reduce the crustal portion to the level of the bone to create a small chamfer for extra restorative space. Here you can see the, the root has been reduced to the proper size and dimensions. And for this case, a Megagen R2 gate guide was fabricated to facilitate fully guided implant placement. After the initial drilling to depth is made, the drill is used to take a PA for visual inspection of the correct placement and alignment. And once osteotomy is completed, a special driver with colored markers is used to place the implant to ensure correct depth and timing of the internal hex. Generally, the implant should be placed away from the socket shield to avoid moving the shield at all, and adequate initial torque is required for provisional fabrication. A 4x4 healing abutment is used to seal the implant while allograft sticky bone is used to fill the jump gap. A chairside provisional was made from acrylic as I was unable to use his PFM crown. The screw retained provisional is inserted and kept out of occlusion. And a small PRF poncho is also placed and a PA is taken to confirm seating and angulation position of the implant. And this is how the patient leaves the clinic on the day of the surgery. At four weeks, the area is healing very well. Note the color and contour of the peri-implant tissue. It is much healthier now, and even some coronal migration has occurred. The occlusal view shows the contour has been maintained very well at this early stage. After three months of healing, a PA is taken to confirm the healing. The tissues look very healthy and stable at this point. And the occlusal view again shows good healing and contour maintenance. So at this time, a customized impression coping is fabricated using the provisional and then used to make a final impression. A final screw retained ceramic crown was made and here's how he looked at crown delivery as noted by some slight blanching of the surrounding tissues. At three weeks after insertion, some photos were taken as long, along with a PA to confirm healing. The patient was very satisfied with his result. And here he is after 16 months. With a new PA to confirm things are unchanged radiographically, uh, there is a very minor amount of recession that has occurred likely related to the bulk of the crown at the marginal area, but overall this result is excellent for a happy patient. Also at 16 months we can see the occlusal view shows great buccal contour maintenance and you know up for a year and a half. And here he is, his before and after. So as you can see, the socket shield technique is truly predictable and promising. It is a remarkable technique that overcomes the many challenges we face with an anterior aesthetic implant. It prevents the collapse of the buccal plate 
eliminates the need for adjunctive gum grafting most of the time, helps provide implant placement towards the palate, and it is the ultimate preservation of biology for implant dentistry. In the past five years, multiple publications have come out, many in the form of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, demonstrating the effectiveness and success rate of the socket shield technique. Even still, while there is, this is all very promising, uh, more research is required, especially in the form of larger, multi-centered prospective studies. With advancements in digital dentistry, guided socket shield preparation is also something in the works and is starting to be done, as well as using partial extraction therapy for full arch cases and alongside dynamic navigation. There is so much more to this technique and its various applications, and I have really only shown you the tip of the iceberg in this presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you were able to take something meaningful away from this quick presentation. If you have been an active member of Bytes Institute, we thank you for your continued support. If you are new to Bytes, we welcome you and are looking forward to seeing you at future courses. A great way to get in touch with us is through our Facebook group, Bytes Global Implant Network, or BEGIN. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me through email or Instagram. Until then, all the best. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Your hairstyle hasn't changed. <laughs> a little bit. Fantastic. Yes. Um, many of the audience uh, say it's a great case, great uh, result. Um, step by step, uh, you know, very clear uh, layout. It's hard to give a 15 minute presentation. I think, you know, yeah. half day presentation is a lot easier than 30 minute presentation. and. 30 minute presentations are a lot easier than 15 minutes, you know, so, uh, but yeah. thank you so much for uh, giving us this wonderful overview, shrinking down to 15 minutes, but also retaining all the important aspect of it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Louis uh, posted on the, the YouTube here saying that what implant was that? I, I thought it was an any ridge, but he thought it was a blue diamond. Was it any ridge? No, no, it's any ridge. Is it any yeah. ridge? What's, what's the yeah. size? 3.5. 3.5, yeah. Are, they, are the walls thick enough for, for the anterior case 3.5 for any ridges? In my experience, yes. I think it has to do with the design of the any ridge implant, how okay. the, the neck of it is, um, there's no thread right at the neck, so there yeah. is some thickness in the wall. Yeah, I think that should help. Because you know like how I feel about uh, you know the curse of a three point five and a lot of uh, fracture <laughs> cases. So um, I'm looking for a narrower diameter implant because at any one lineup, the, unfortunately, thread goes all the way to the top. I'm a little gun shy of using three point five conical connection. So I looked at the right. blue diamond. I also look at the any ridge that the wall seemed to be a lot thicker than the uh, the any one lineup. That's great. Yeah. Um, I've done socket shield as well, but not as not as to the, the degree of like you do. You do a lot more socket shield uh, cases than I do. I find the uh, the part that makes me take the longest time, right? Compared to my mm -hmm. non socket shield anterior cases, is always the mm -hmm. extraction. Yeah, always course, the extraction. Yes. Yeah. What's your what's your tip? What's the tip or tricks? Uh, the the biggest tip I would say is that kit. You know, I think that kit has the best um, sequence of drills, mm -hmm. and I think it's really kind of you know curated to doing this procedure and this procedure only. So I think that is is very good. You just take each drill to kind of completion. Mm -hmm. and move on to the next step and eventually it does get faster i remember when i first started it would take me like 30 40 minutes to do one mm -hmm. you know and now it's if i don't have the document it's like 10 minutes um, mm -hmm. so 
Uh, I also think another really important step, which I highlighted in my presentation, is to make sure that you measure the length of the uh, of the canal, so that your first burr can be very accurate and can actually get down to the apex. Um, one one big disadvantage of this procedure is that you cannot visualize, you know, the apex when you are cutting, right? Because it's just too too dark in there. So. Mm. Um, getting it measured on the CT, maybe even making a separate guide just mm. to guide the socket kind of uh, separation part mm. is something we can, uh, we can start doing more. I've also seen uh, some of the colleagues use an apex locator yeah. to precisely do that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's one way to measure that because that's that initial section. That's the most important, isn't it? You don't want to yes. go too shallow. If you go to too shallow, what happened to me was I was snapping it, my both my buckle plate started moving, and when when that happens, you know that it's not going to work, right? Yeah. Yeah, you got to take so it out. So that's the part that uh, takes the longest time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see right over here. Uh, Doctor Katie Chung, uh, at the final impression stage, is there soft tissue covering the shield, or is the coronal portion of the shield still exposed? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in a correct socket shield, there should be soft tissue there, so that goes with um, how kind of apical you're you're putting the the shield. So it needs to be at your bone level or below the bone, slightly, so that you have that room for the soft tissue to grow in. Mm. Um, it's also important when you make your provisional to not over bulk that area on the buckle because you want soft tissue to fill in as opposed to um, your restoration, which would lead to like thinner tissue, maybe some recession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly the mistake that I did. When I was extracting the palatal portion, my buckle shield moved a little bit and I thought it would have been okay. Mm -hmm. It moved a little bit and I didn't remove enough of the coronal part of the shield. So mm -hmm. in four months later, when my prosthetic doctor was went there to remove the temporary and take an impression, she thought that the little shield that was left exposed was my mistake of forgetting to extract the root. So she pulled it out. <laughs> and then she told me, you know what, Dr. Kwan? You forgot to take a piece of a root. I took it out for you. <laughs> and as she looked at me and smiled, I said, and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think those of you who've done uh, circuit shield in the you know, earlier stage, um, making mis that's a common mistake. So don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Yeah, um, it can happen. What I find is having done so many anterior cases, um, there are other ways to bulk up the, what we call collapse of the, the buckle plate, right? Yeah. For example, CTG, you know, we've yeah. done a lot of that uh, because we know the bundle bone is going to collapse. So we are placing CTG uh, at the same time of doing surgery or, or, you know, stage cases, we do that. Or other way of doing it is like a dual zone grafting, you know, put some uh, sticky bone all the way to the gingival margin level. But in comparison to socket shield, it doesn't come close. Because the dual zone and the CTG, in my hand, it will improve, but it's never yeah. a preservation, right? Because yeah. surgically compensating, I think there's a limitation, right? You know, um, like now you, you're a par your periodontist. Is this your go-to way of doing the anterior cases? Uh, if the case selection meets the requirement, right? Yeah. What's the pro uh, uh, proportion, like, you know, doing this way or doing the traditional of a uh, implant and a uh, CTG, you know, uh, you know, what, what, how has it been uh, progressed over the last few years? Yeah, I would say that this is my default um, in mm. terms of not only anteriors, I, I am starting to do a few more in the posterior as well, uh, oh. upper premolars, you know, those need that buckle preservation as much 
as the front ones do. The canines are, this is a great, great um, procedure for canines. Um, so yeah, whenever the criteria are met, uh, I always try to. And even if I'm unsure, when at the consultation, I will tell the patient about this procedure. Most of them are very receptive. You know, I think if you explain it to them in a simplistic way, they can, they kind of understand. It's like, it's like PRF, you know, explaining PRF to them. They just get it. And they're like, mm. yeah, I want that, you know? So mm. um, I explain it to them, tell them that it's possible to sometimes during the procedure, we have to kind of change gears if, mm. you know, the shield becomes mobile or it's too short or something like that. But yeah, I would say this is my go-to um, before any of the other ones you mentioned, like dual zone and, uh, and veneer grafting. Gotcha. Yeah. There is no special fee guide for socket shield in BC. How about in Toronto? Any better? It's definitely not labeled as socket shield, <laughs> but there are so many different ways that you can code like an extraction. Oh, so you yeah. can get a little creative with that. Yeah. Do you, do you charge a half the extraction fee because you're taking the half to half the root? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Because it's the conversation that I had with Bernard. Bernard goes, you know what? We should charge you more because it takes much longer. Mm -hmm. And I was jokingly telling Bernard, I said, you know what? You're only taking half the tooth, Bernard. And you want to give me 50% <laughs> off? He looked at me funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah because it's, it, that's one of the things that, uh, like for me, I do 80% is a full arch. Um, yeah. But it's hard for me to do a socket shield when doing a full arch. First of all, there's not that many cases that qualify because a lot of my patients uh, lose their tic-tac problem. problem. Um, but those cases do re uh, would benefit. It's just a time thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had one of my friend Alan Costa from Brazil. He did a case where he did socket shield from premolar to premolar, all of them. Right, and then did the implants and, and things like that. I mean, it looks beautiful, it looks beautiful. Um, in your opinion, what is the number mm -hmm. one common uh, cause of complication? Okay, you know, a lot of people, it's, it is a, it's a technique sensitive, right? Right. Yes. It's not, is it something that you can recommend a beginner surgeon to be able to do this or you know they should have some anterior immediate implant placement surgery under their belt before they start something like this um, the way i see it is that they're two separate things so mm -hmm. the sock the making the socket shield is one thing and doing a proper anterior uh, aesthetic implant is another thing and i think if you it's easier, obviously, if you've already done some anterior cases mm -hmm. so that that part of your procedure is something you're used to, something gotcha. you're familiar with. And then the socket shield becomes the only kind of new thing that you're adding. Um, I would say the most common complication during the procedure is that very first step is the angulation and the depth of your section. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's done incorrectly, you'll either end up with too much shield left on the buckle or too little shield left on the buckle, um, possibly resulting in a mobile, mobile shield and having to remove it. So that I would say is the most common complication. But if you follow each of the steps in the protocol, I, you know, knock on what I haven't had, I've only had one kind of complication after, you know, the surgery has been done and the tooth has been restored. So. Hmm. So the first drill that will dictate how easily the, the, the palatal extraction is going to be, right? Yeah. 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 Um, is there any contraindication for a socket shield? The reason I ask is there seems to be a lot of variation. Some surgeons totally avoid if there's any pathological um, lesions. Um, some, some are not bothered by it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what's your guideline? So apical lesions, uh, the way I look at those is if you can remove it, you know, predictably the lesion, um, then you can still do the socket shield. Uh, it might make your buckle shield a bit shorter cause you're removing a bit of that apical portion. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have enough left, then it's okay. 
Mm -hmm. uh, a true under a true like absolute contraindication would be mobility. So if there's any mobility in that shield, um, that should have to be removed. Just because if there's mobility at the time of surgery, mm -hmm. it's likely to move afterwards, and then it, it can become infected. Mm -hmm. um, another contraindication would be like active perio, which mm -hmm. generally yeah. causes mobility anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're you're kind of in the same you know ballpark there. Uh, and then external resorption is also kind of a relative contraindication. Uh, in my experience, I would say as long as you can remove um, and get to nice, clean root structure mm -hmm. and still have enough for your shield, then that's okay. But if the exter external resorption is, let's say, in the middle of the mm -hmm. buckle, then you have to remove that whole root. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, socket shield, uh, I compare the cases that I've done socket shield five years ago compared to my other cases that I did not do socket shield. Um, they both turn out acceptable, but when I really do a mm -hmm. um, photo, especially from the shot that you did, occlusal field, like definitely there's, there's a difference, okay? Yeah, it's almost as if uh, body thinks that nothing was done. And really, yeah. that's the case, isn't it? We're tricking the body to think that tooth is still there, right? Exactly. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Yeah, we had a question of Dr. Louis, again, sizing. For canines, do you go up in the implant size to 4.0 or 4.5, any ridge? Yes, I would. Yeah, because canine, if you knew you were something more beefier. And I think uh, yeah. the canine is a great site to do a socket shield because yeah. the buckle eminence is so far out, number one. Yeah. So once you create a shield, yeah. you still have an ample amount of the space to hug the palatal plate, right? And you'll have enough of a jump gap. That's one. And exactly. second reason would be canines are so hard to remove the, the root as a whole anyways. <laughs> so you're cutting it <laughs> yeah. half. Okay, that would be my rationale. Um, and, yeah. and also third reason will be keeping the buckle plate where it is. It really protects the rest of the, uh, the profile, right? I think that really sets the tone. There's multiple good reasons why yeah. canines should be uh, definitely be in the selection case. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Also another is Dr. E. Uh, what's the minimum size requirement for the shield? I guess he's talking about the thickness. We get that asked a mm. lot. Is there such a thing yeah. as a minimum? Yeah, it's really hard because you're not going to be able to see exactly what the minimum thickness is other than at the very coronal portion. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say probably 0.5 millimeters is as thin as you can make it. Mm. And sometimes for lateral incisors, that's necessary because the spacing is just so small. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right about the canine. So for the same reason, canines mm -hmm. are good. Uh, laterals are tougher, right? This is the yeah, opposite oh yeah. because there's just such little space sometimes. Yeah, I, will, I don't, I'll be too scared to do a socket shield for the laterals and also lower mm -hmm. anteriors. I, there's just not enough yeah. room, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, canines, I find that canines and central incisors, upper, uh, those I feel a little more confident. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Um, and I guess the same token goes to the question is how much of gap, the jump gap, because obviously once you do the socket shield and you place the implant palatally, it's nice to have that jump gap, don't you? You don't want the implant to be touching that shield. Yeah, for multiple reasons. Yeah, there's actually two camps right now um, on this topic. So one mm. camp says you shouldn't touch the shield. I'm, I belong in that camp. Me too. Um, and yeah. another camp says you should touch the shield because it gives you like more stability, almost like a bicortical stabilization. Mm -hmm. um, except in this case, you don't really have a cortical stabilization on the coronal part on your implant. Um, but my reasoning for not recommending touching the shield is because the implant goes in with torque, right? It goes in with circular torque and I think uh, if you engage the shield in kind of with too much torque or in the wrong kind of direction you can actually cause mobility mobility okay. you know so um, that's without knowing, the reason why without I, knowing. We, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And um, that's the reason why I like to have that jump gap. And I generally still fill the jump gap with, with bone graft, like you saw in my case. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I don't think there is a benefit, that much of benefit of actually hugging the, the, the shield. Yeah, you know, uh, number one reason I think a lot of socket shield fail is because of the micro movement of the shield. Yeah. Yeah, and those are the cases. So a very good question. Uh, Dr. Chris Song uh, asks, uh, what's the best way to reach the apex of tooth with the first burr? Now you're, you're using the special kit, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I've used a multiple socket shield drill kit but in my honest opinion, one by the Mega Gen, uh, the root membrane kit, the PET kit, yeah, I think nothing beats it really. You know, it's, it's a it's a really good kit with all the measurement and everything. Um, exactly. Like for me, when I was using it, I was using a rubber stopper. You know, like from an angle, yeah. yeah, stopper. I, I, I for whatever I measure from the CBCT, I will measure it, and that will give me a pretty close ballpark how far to go. Right. How right. do you do it? Yeah, so I don't uh, use an endo file. I just use the CBCT measurement, and then I yeah. use that first number one drill in the in the partial extraction kit, mm -hmm. and that has a stopper that you can set at various distances. So it's the same, yeah. it's the exact same, same concept. Yeah. Um, and then I think with more, I think with more repetition, you get better at getting the angulation right. Because a lot of times these anterior roots are very buccal, and uh, when they're buccal, you you sometimes are drilling more towards the palate, mm -hmm. and then once you're done sectioning and you take out the palate, it's just a tiny little piece, and then you realize you didn't get the plane like the the direction of your plane yeah. right. So that will come with experience, yeah. but again, it can be something that can be guided. You can have the Absolutely. implant surgical guide made as if you were placing an implant right into the canal. That's right. And get the exact depth and just use, let's say, the initial implant drill yeah. to, to remove the gutta percha or the, or the nerve That's or whatever right. is in there. Especially nowadays, like, you know, like Scott and Paul, they have their own little printer in, his, yeah. in their home. And they print their own guide. And I've seen Scott have a multiple guide for anterior, right? One for the depth yeah. control, one for sectioning sideways, right? And one for the implant <laughs> placement, like three guys, right? And it's yeah. so cheap, so cheap to print. So really, the yeah. creativity is the only limitation, right? There's exactly. many different ways. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Six fifty-eight. All right. So David, give us the uh, code. Yeah. And we're nearing the end. So you guys, whoever is joining uh, live, yeah, you are entitled to uh, apply for the uh, one AGD CE credit, and this is the verification code. Okay, so take a picture of it, uh, or memorize it, or write it down. Okay, and we really appreciate you joining us live, um, and also want to thank Dr. Uh, Jeff Lee for um, this is past his bedtime. <laughs> okay, for joining us, Walter from Toronto, and thank you. So those much. of you who want to uh, take some of that, Dr. Jeff Lee, he writes a wonderful soft tissue course, two-day soft tissue course for FGG and CTG. So, um, you know, sign up, I'm taking some of his course, and he is really, really all about fundamental and biology, and many of our resident doctors have taken his courses, and it's a fantastic course, okay? You know, I always say, don't set the tone, but the soft tissue is always the issue, okay? So, Jeff, thank you so much. You take care. Thank you. And hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And I'll see you guys next week. Next week, we have Dr. sang Helm, and he will be joining us, celebrating our episode three of 20 Year Bites Institute anniversary, and his topic will be on immediate locators. So stay tuned for that. Don't okay? miss it. Yeah, you need to subscribe though, okay? So, so we'll send the link. And then you'll subscribe and reserve your uh, link and then we'll have a great time again. All right. Take care, guys. Have a wonderful awesome. evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.
with me cause 